Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, God, man. Are you sure you're through? I have an announcement today. My sermon is not going to be that long. Well, this is a real honor to be here. I, I got to tell you, in the cradle of AA, and I better tell you right off the bat, did you say Bailey too? He said, oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Jack, and I am an alcoholic. Yeah. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, privileged. A hell of an inconvenience. (laughs) Lou called me in February, and and, and I know what I was saying to him. And I never did understand that for sure about breakfast. And when you say yes to something in February, you're sure it'll go away, right? (laughs) It didn't. And I... Lou and uh, Dick Moneybags were up at the Cleveland airport, and we had a wonderful trip back. God, we went through Canal Fulton, we were over in Kent for a while, Maslin. Dick said finally, do you know where the hell you're going? Old Lou the Pathfinder said, no. <laughs> and he didn't, but we finally got here, and, and uh, it's been enjoyable. I've met a lot of you people, and I, I, uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. Well, here are your jokes, Lou, for, for next year. <laughs> I, um, I'd like to pick my sermon this morning, dearly beloved. <laughs> on the theme of what I like about Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I give the whole damn speech in two words. Everything. And sit down, but you went through that breakfast. You ought to get something. So, uh, (laughs) somebody said, what can they do to eggs? Well, they can freeze them. tell you, seriously, I have never seen this big a crowd serve this fast. Whoever those girls were, that's good. I only bring you some coffee, you rat. Uh, Yeah, uh, I tell you this at the beginning for two reasons. Uh, I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous come next October, for 30 years. <laughs> that applause was the first reason. <laughs> I like to hear him clap at the beginning because you're not too sure what happens at the end. <laughs> and the other reason is a much better reason, I must say. It's the only way I personally can recommend Alcoholics Anonymous because if I hadn't have enjoyed it, if I hadn't have gotten a lot of good out of it, if I hadn't have led a happy and passing normal life, you can bet your uh, uh, bird <laughs> you can bet your bird I wouldn't have stuck around for 30 years. But it gets more better. And I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And the thrill of speaking to a crowd like this in sort of the cradle of AA is an enormous thrill. It took me 30 years to find out where the hell it started. I didn't know that until I got here. Um, I thought Bill Wilson was president for all all these years, and I find out Dr. Bob, the guy that helped him, he helped him. I didn't know who did what to who, but it sure came out good, didn't it? Yeah. Right on. Now, 
For me to stand here and tell you the history of uh, AA would be ridiculous. You know more about it than I do. I never got us straight about that lady from the tire company, Mrs. Cyberling. She, was she sober? Okay. And I have said many times, and I meant this with great respect, that when I first joined AA, I was delighted to know that it wasn't caused by some do-gooders or some social workers or some psychologists. Or <laughs> yes, even the clergy. Anyway, <laughs> I'm glad to find out it was started by a couple other birds that couldn't drink either. <laughs> huh? And I found out that one guy lost his, uh, I'm going to say that word yet, lost his seat on the stock market. Another was a disbarred doctor. Another was a crooked nun. <laughs> Those are my kind of people. I like that. You bet. I met, I met Sister Ignatia in uh, Cleveland. And I scared the hell out of him. She looked like my mother. <laughs> really? No, oh, she was a lot of people's mother. She was darling. I did not, unfortunately, have the honor of meeting Dr. Bob, but I met Mr. Bill. And, you know, in, in the showbiz and all that, you're supposed to be glib and everything. And we got through lunch in New York, uh, Bill and some secretary and I, and I started saying goodbye. And by God, I got a lump in my throat and couldn't say it. You know, that day, uh, there, but grace of God, I don't know where I'd have been without Wilson and Bob and Sister Ignatia. And, uh, well, I, I just love them. Still do. And so they, it's a, it's a triple honor to be here, really. I was at Sister Ignatia's dinner in Cleveland with four of the mafia. <laughs> And I was halfway through my sermon before I got my, my transportation money. I was worried. I, <laughs> and I found out that the chairman was was the guy that was a hairdresser, and that worried me. <laughs> and, 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 but as all a functions, it, it worked out pretty good. <laughs> but I was glad when I got in AA that, that it was just a bunch of... People couldn't drink. I I fought it for a long time. Uh, mercifully, I'm not going to do a drunk a uh, I tell you the truth, I can't because uh, I forgot the best part of it. <laughs> and I must have been an alcoholic, all right, because the reports are still coming in after 30 years. <laughs> But I don't think that that's necessary. I can assure you uh, that alcohol never did me any good. I thought it did, but it didn't always work out that way. Now, what we're supposed to do is uh, say what we're like and what we're going to be or where we're going. or some kind of a format there. And uh, <laughs> what I can do is say, as I already said, alcohol never did any good for me. I don't remember starting drinking. Now, I noticed a lot of ladies, uh, God bless them, the members, uh, they, when they were kids, they read a lot. They, they were always reading and hiding in books. Well, I read a comic strip once as a kid and didn't understand it, so I quit reading. And I don't even remember my first drink. Somebody probably asked me to have a drink, and I took it, and I don't know what happened. Nothing, I guess. And then in uh, high school, I was a sophomore in high school, and I was drinking at weekends and like you do as a high school kid, not the way they do now, dude. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I fell in love. I have been all my life a great lover. <laughs> and the older I get, the more I like to tell you about that. Anyway... I, uh, I fell in this love with this girl in this little town, Iowa, and what I had learned from drinking then was nothing compared to what she was teaching me. That <laughs> I enjoyed that more at the time. That seemed to be quite a thing there, and I didn't understand it, but I was learning, and my mother didn't like this girl. 
Now that has happened in a lot of people's lives. So my gosh, as a sophomore in high school, she sent me to a military academy. Now that's, that's next to prison. That, that's no good. Anyway, to get away from this girl, I had to go to a little military school in, um, in Otana, Minnesota. Well, I met a guy there who taught me the glories of lemon extract. Now that'll take the hair right out of your throat. Oh, God. But anyway, we did that and we'd smoke and, We'd be devilish. And then there was a call to go out for football. And I uh, <laughs> went out for football. I really wouldn't left this. I went out for football. And by George, I made the team. Now, in the academy, there were only 12 guys out for football. That, <laughs> and it only takes 11. And the other had a bad leg. So I was on the football team as a quarterback because I could yell. Now, my friend told me about... Lemon extract, he also, he also made the team. And he had one more affliction than I have. His, um, his problem was, as a sophomore in high school, he still wet the bed. <laughs> now, all of us in the academy called him P.P. Seaver. <laughs> and I just loved old P.P. He just, he's just a real neat guy. He, Later, he made the swimming team. <laughs> yeah, the, the backstroke. Anyway. So, BP and I were playing football, and the coach called us in one day and said, Now, we're going to play in St. Paul. It's a big academy up there, boys. And I don't want any of you clowns on this Pillsbury team to try and play football. They'll kill you up there. If the ball's coming towards you, drop it. <laughs> If you're supposed to run around one end, don't run, fall down. <laughs> Just keep out there for an hour, and if you do that and live through it, we're going to let you free over the weekend in St. Paul. Now, here comes my first problem with alcohol. P.P. invited me to his house, and we went over to his house, and his father drank, which was a glorious thing to find out in St. Paul. Nothing much else to do there. <laughs> so we got into Papi's father's brew. <clears throat> we got about half potted, and I said, "You know, I never liked the coach, Papi. He's 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 a bad man. He's not a good character. And I think you and I ought to go down to the hotel, and I'm going to tell him what to think of." Him. So we took another drink. Papi said, "I'll drive you." <laughs> and he drove me all the way down St. Paul. Now St. Paul in October, November is cold. So we, like a froze getting down there, we got in a steam-heated room, and I got to throwing up on the coach, and he was telling me what he thought of me, and I never got to tell him what I thought of him. <laughs> Except the following Monday, I was kicked out of military academy, and only because I was drunk. But that didn't make a difference when you're sophomore in high school. I, I didn't learn any lesson from that. And I thought, well, that, they don't need me. I'm about to one of the three guys paying tuition anyway. The hell with him. And I got a job playing with the dance band. I finally went back to Little Town, Iowa, finished high school, and I got into the University of Drake. Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. And there I was supposedly studying for the ministry. <laughs> My mother was a devout Methodist, and I went and told her I was going to divinity school. They have pamphlets, too, and I'd send those home a lot. Say, this course on feeding the Armenian was interesting. Oh, All that phony stuff, I was playing with a dance band, bootlegging at the um, fraternity house, and I was uh, kind of the cat on the campus there. So one day at homecoming, I had sampled some of my brew too much, and I was a yell leader. I didn't go out for football. I was a yell leader. I got out in the football field, and I thought the whole homecoming thing was in my honor. <laughs> and at halftime, I grabbed the drum major's baton, threw it over the gridiron, trying to catch it, and looked up, and there was a nine-foot cop standing right there. <laughs> and he said, come here, drunko. <laughs> and he threw me out of the game, and the following Monday, I got kicked out of Drake because of drinking.
So I had a lot of problems with drinking. Then, yeah, and then I, well, the curtain fall. Many years later, I was in San Diego, California, at the great exposition they had there, the World's Fair, and I was a marker for the streets of Paris, where for ten cents they'd take it off <laughs> if you had a X-ray eye. Anyway. I fell in love again, dear friends. Ah, the romance budded. Now, the only trouble with this romance was that her husband <laughs> was in the U.S. Navy. And as far as we could ascertain, he was out at sea protecting our shores. And I invited this charming lady to the uh, hotel on Lower Fifth Street in San Diego, and Lower Fifth Street's exactly what you think it is. <laughs> yes. And all of a sudden, there was a knock on the door, and here was her un-American husband and a cop, and I went back to the clink. I was arrested for being lewd and dissolute. <laughs> I just loved that. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I was in AA for two years. <laughs> So the drinking got me. Now, that lady was a classy lady. I always pick classy ladies. You will think this is a gag. It is not. Her job was a shill in the Filipino pool hall. <laughs> High class. Always first class. All right, the scene changes. Now we're back in <laughs> Glamour City, Hollywood. And one morning on Queen for a Day, I... Uh, sitting at the table in the Moulin Rouge, doing my very best to get a shot glass up to my head, which, as you folks know, is a problem at times, right? <laughs> Jiggle glass, done it. Well, as I was sitting there trying to do that, a clean old man that worked on the show walked by and said, you're just going to have the one. <laughs> I hadn't heard that from anybody <laughs> my close acquaintance at that time. And I said, yes, just this one. I had to be one last night. And he always made me sick in the morning. And I just, he said, you're a liar, but I'll tell you what. If you ever want to do anything about your drinking, and you better, you give me a call. I once was sober for five years, had a bottle of beer, and I was drunk for five years. And I thought, well, we got a real cuckoo here. <laughs> a hell of a big bottle of beer. <laughs> See, the normal people don't know, do they? <laughs> no, sir, they don't know. Well, anyway, the minute he told me that, I promptly had him fired, as any good alcoholic would. Don't want him talking to the big star like that by George. So we got rid of him the next day. He got a hell of a good job. And he's been very, very, very well off ever since. <laughs> so I fixed him, right? <laughs> but he did one thing that we do more of than I think we think we do. He planted the seed. He planted the seed. And... Mercifully, it sprouted later. So after I got rid of him, I began thinking, as all good alcoholics do, I wonder if they're right. I wonder if all these people are right that are telling me all this. And uh, why are they ignoring me so much? And why did they break away immediately that I come into their company? And you get to thinking of those things, and then you take a few drinks and you forget it. And you take a few more and you don't care. And you take a few more and you don't remember. <laughs> so you just, uh, it just fine there for a long time until something inside tells you it ain't going right, Jack. It ain't going right, Ruth. Something wrong. So one Sunday morning, there was nobody in the house, and I um, decided to experiment to see how long in the morning I could go without a drink. Now, I was a, a daily drinker, round the clock, every minute. So that experiment of going without a drink was most unsuccessful. I had a terrible time with that. Uh, I thought I drank the coffee too fast. You know how we alcoholics figure those things out in our big brain? Smoke. 
took a deep drag. That's what's doing. I went outside on the porch, put my round, arm around the post on the porch, take a big breath of air. That like to killed me. <laughs> and that was before smog. <laughs> and I found out after I'd been sober about six months, we didn't have a post on the porch. <laughs> So you know the thing the thing dawned on me. Thank God that seed sprouted that that clean old man had planted. Now I don't like clean old men and I didn't like him sober and I want to tell you I hated this bat this guy I hated him because he planted that seed. But I thought well if he's so smart I'll call him. Now I <laughs> in the morning I never had the shakes. I had the leaps. <laughs> God, I was leaping around that house like a jackass. And I got to tell you something, I had an awful time with that phone. <laughs> but finally, I got a hold of this clean old man. And he said, I said, you told me call you. If I ever got one doing anything about drink. And I got to tell you something, I'm scared to death. I was. I was scared. So were you. So I called him and said, I'm scared. He said, well, do you admit you're an alcoholic? And I said, hell well, yes, I admit I'm an alcoholic. He said, good. Everybody in town knows it. Now it's unanimous. <laughs> well, I didn't like that. And I said, you're not supposed to make fun of me. I'm not well, and I want you to be careful. <laughs> so he said, well, i tell you what you do. You go out in the kitchen and take a drink. And I thought, what the hell did you do? I'm hallucinating on the phone now. And I said, don't get the kids. Now, what did you say? <laughs> he said, go out in the kitchen and take a drink. Your head's rattling so I can't hear you on the phone. He take a drink, and I'm going to come over to your house and talk to you. Well, buddy, that's the first time I like to hear you, I tell you that. <laughs> and I put that phone down the cradle, and I did just what he said. <laughs> I, I went out, and I had a drink. <laughs> and let the tape show I'm holding up two fingers. <laughs> I went out and took a drink. And now, six months before this time, I had gone to a doctor. I had been sent to a doctor. And he examined me from head to toe, considerably long time in the middle there of me. And I, I just laid there on that old cold slab you're on. And he couldn't find anything. And I said, well, thank God. Give me my pants. Let me get out of here. And he said, wait a minute. If you keep drinking like you're drinking now, in six months, you got to be dead. I said, you, did you find anything wrong? He said, no, can't understand technically. And I said, well, then don't send me a bill. You didn't find it. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So I got my pants on and went back to my office at the Hollywood Plaza bar. <laughs> hey, yes, of course, I'd been freed from the doctor. He told me I'm going to die in six months. Didn't bother me. Boy, us drunks are brilliant, huh? So we held my own wake at the bar. <laughs> you may be sure I led the singing and bought the drinks. And we sang things like, I'm waiting for ships that never come in. I cried, they left, got a new bunch. And our, our, our big number was, they all hummed. And I sang, now is the hour when I must say goodbye. And we, oh yeah, a big deal there. But I, that's not what a jackass I am. That's what all of us are when we're drunk. That flip, we know what we're doing. And anyway, uh, the old man came over, and he sat down, and he started talking. But all he did was talk about himself. Now, that annoyed me, because I had made the call, right? <laughs> and I is a sickie. <laughs> And here's this jerk sitting over there, cool, sane, and sober, telling me about the fact that he drank so much that he had to live in a chicken house. Well, now I felt sorry, really. I thought, what a pity you had to live in a chicken house with your children. 
I'm not exactly living in a chicken house here. And then I think I heard the back door. And I'd go answer the back door, and there's nobody there. <laughs> and I come back in, and we'd hear some more about the chicken house. So, God. so then I'd go upstairs and answer the phone. No phone up there. And I, <laughs> all of a sudden, I made another trip to some place, and when I got back in, he said, Jack, why don't you bring the bottle in here? <laughs> said, jerk that I am, how did you know? <laughs> well, he said the magic word because I'm one too. I'm one too. Maybe that's when I learned it takes a thief to catch a thief, it takes a drunk to catch a drunk. And now he annoyed me no end. For the rest of the time, he told me 15 places I could have been hiding the bottle instead of those stinking five of mine. <laughs> I could have been a half in a bag. But I only had five slugs, and that guy told me all about it. Now then, the big moment came. I said, that's good program. I forgot one thing that Lou put in the uh, flyer. This guy really said it. Lou lies a lot, but this was the truth. <laughs> After I'd had a couple drinks and he came over to tell me about his chicken house, I got smarts. You know, with a few drinks, and I opened the door and said, Come on in, Mike. Whatever it is you're selling, if I like it, fine. If I don't, the hell with it. And mercifully, he said, Look, Jack, you need us, but we don't need you. And that hurt me, because I, by then, after I'd had two more drinks, expected to be president of AA within six weeks. <laughs> Always very humble. Yes. <laughs> Well, anyway, we got to the point where you all have heard and you all have said, and we have all said, <laughs> now we'll go to a meeting. And I said, <laughs> me? <laughs> a meeting? You should say not. He said, why not? I said, well, I don't want them to know. I'm a big star. I don't, I don't want them to be seen in an AA meeting. But if people recognize me, that would be bad. And he looked at me and he said, who's going to recognize you from radio? <laughs> then <laughs> the magic time came where I said, no, I'm not going down under my own name at all. I'm not going to tell them who I am. I'm going to use another name. He said, fine, hell, you use any name you want to. Pick a name. Well, that's a drunken challenge that you love. Boy, I, I worked on that, i got to tell you, for ten minutes. I went around, I'd look in the mirror and see you know. all. Finally came up with a real cool name, Jim Bartell. <laughs> if you're going to pick a name, you pick one like Sylvester, Ash Mead, something smart, but Jim Bartell. So the night we went to the meeting, which was that night, I had this poor patient jerk rehearse introducing me to the steering wheel. It's just the two of us in the car. And he'd say, Jim, this is Ruth. Claude, this is Jim. Why he didn't kill me, I don't know. Anyway, we got to the meeting in North Hollywood, and before the meeting, just the meeting starts, they turn out the lights. And I thought we were staying outside quite a while. By then, I wanted to meet everybody. <laughs> take their inventory. Anyway, I was, all of a sudden, we got in the door and the lights went out. Now, nobody got to meet me. That was a shame. I'm not worried. And all I remember about the first meeting is the guy was from San Francisco, and when he was a kid, he hadn't had any tennis shoes. <laughs> and I thought, that's a shame. And so I rose in the meeting and offered him some tennis shoes. <laughs> And I got a karate chop in the belly, I won't forget. <laughs> so then when he got to the uh of the amen in the Lord's Prayer, I was outside again. Nobody to this day has ever met Jim Bartell. <laughs> Except me, and I don't ever want to see Jim Bartell again. <laughs> He's a turkey.
But that's how it started. And then the glory came after I got over worrying about what the hell they're selling books for. And where's the sawdust? Where's the bass drums? Where's the damper? You all did that. Most of you. And all of a sudden you find out you kind of like it. And then it began to dawn on me that I wasn't any of the things I'd been called by her. <laughs> her was not an Al-Anon. That's a beautiful thing. I would have helped her. Anyway, I was not weak-willed. I was not no good. I was not this. I was not that. All the junk we've been called. One day she said, what do you sit around and drink all the time for? And I had a good answer. I said, well, what else can I do? Hmm. She said, well, go outside and pull up some grass and shove it back in. <laughs> After the meeting, if you care together in one of the corners, I'll tell you where I was really told to shove that grass. <laughs> I don't need to, huh? <laughs> But I began to dawn on me that I was not any of these things that we've been accused of, <laughs> falsely accused of, friends. We're not weak-willed, no good, none of that. We're sick. Ha! <laughs> God, was I glad to hear that. <laughs> oh, that's better than all of them. Now, this got nothing to do with A, but according to the medical profession, the three worst diseases known to the medical profession are cancer, Heart and us. <laughs> We're as third sick as we can get. <laughs> and that's sick enough for me. That, I had to catch something. Thank God I got this one. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear that. Now you know about the inroads are making cancer. You know what they're doing about heart. But this is the only sickness in the world where there's some place to go. You never heard of Hearts Anonymous, have you? <laughs> Two belts of this coffee and a dance kill half their members. <laughs> ah. right. So I maintain, how lucky can you get? And another thing, nobody in here promised you that they could cure you from this alcoholism. But they can arrest it. And if there's anything wrong with Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion, the opinion of thousands of others there isn't, it's that one little phrase, don't take the first drink. That's too simple for the alcoholic brain to get through his head. What do you mean, don't take the first drink? Well, that's the one that gets you drunk. I don't get drunk on one drink. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> then you call a guy that's had more time on, let him talk. <laughs> now then. Where in the medical profession our sickness is number three, in the cuckoo department <laughs> we're number two. Really? Yeah. Crazy. Number one is a violent social disease. Starts with this. It's no worse than that Polish joke. Anyway. <laughs> And that's the truth. And I figure if a guy hadn't been drunk, he wouldn't caught that. Anyway, the thing is, he's just about dead, and you're almost nuts. And the only thing to do is arrest that, cause of that. Well, the thing, too, is you got to reach the end of a line. He'll tell you that a lot. you got to be no good in some department. Got to be no good in all departments. That's better, but you got to be no good. So why wouldn't I be proud and happy to join in an organization and stay with it? For the only requisites to get in Alcoholics Anonymous, you got to be damn near dead, putting your nuts, and no good to get in. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous does not want nice people. Is that clear? <laughs> no good. worst drunk we've got are ones that are the best secretaries. <laughs> they always run for an office, and it's just great. I know when I first joined many years ago, perhaps a lot of you wondering, and I don't think it's in your business, but I'll tell you, 
I've been in 30 years, and I joined when I was 11. Now, <laughs> or so, or so. Well, the thing is, what I enjoyed about it is that everybody's here for the same thing. Now, my gosh, you know, I, uh, I hated joining. I didn't like anything. It made me go to the Rotary Club <laughs> to meet different people. Hmm. The talks were so bad at the Rotary Club, I drank triples instead of doubles. <laughs> and that was awful. I, I quit the Masons. I, I, I quit them. There was a fella that re reached up under my apron one day, and I just, I, 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 I got out of there. <laughs> you Catholics, go ahead and laugh. I got one for you later. Have you happened yet, Louis? <laughs> yeah, you're all right so far. <laughs> but everybody in AA is here for the same thing. Damnest thing I ever saw. Rotary Club, they say, here's my car, I'm a plumber. Mm -hmm. You want to use car, high end, three wheels. They, they all hustle in. Here, they're going to, all they do here is take your inventory. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all right, too, because you can take theirs. If, if they shut up a minute. Everybody tries to be at first like I was. All things to all AAs. I, God, I was a banner carrier. I'd make them take beer signs down, do all that junk. And I couldn't 12 step. I, I was no good at 12 stepping. And so I went to one of the old Kliegels back there and dusted him off, got the moss off his teeth and said, I can't 12 step. What the hell I do? He said, well, you don't have to do everything. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so I felt good. You see, here's the thing. I did try the 12 step, and I had the first five 12 steps I made. I had two suicides and natural deaths, and two of them we never heard from. <laughs> So if you have anybody in the Akron area you really hate, I'll 12 step them and kill them. But you don't worry about all that. That's the beautiful thing of this program. You know, set rule. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. But you better. <laughs> It's either, in my opinion, <laughs> the opinion of thousands, <laughs> it's either AA or Amen. <laughs> and uh, that's not a chance I, I care to take. I, I just like to go along. When I first got here, uh, it was so many years ago, they, they were hiding us, for God's sake. They used to hide us in the cellar if they thought we wouldn't suffocate. <laughs> my wife would close the drapes. And I walk around the house, stiffer in a boot, naked. <laughs> Sorry you missed that, friends. <laughs> I wore a hat. Honestly, God, I wore a hat, very elegant. Wore a hat and a jaunty... Oh, God. Anyway, there was an old maid lived next door to us. And now, wait a minute... <laughs> You're right, but maybe you know. <laughs> And this old maid was Walker Dog. Now, she was a mullet like I've never seen. Poor old thing, and the dog even hated her. Anyway, <laughs> she walked by, and I thought, she needs help. <laughs> and I'd wait till she'd get right opposite the bay window, and just as she'd come by, I'd be standing there with my hat, and I'd <laughs> give her a little peek. Yeah. Gave her a nice little peek there. And she either moved away or laughed herself to die. I never saw her. What the hell happened to her? And I am the only one, you may be sure, that thought that was funny then. Oh, my God. All those terrible things that I thought was bad. No good. You know somebody... Uh, you probably don't probably know this anyway, but I'm going to tell you. It's the only organization I know of that you can't get kicked out of. Isn't that great? 
is the only organization of people that are trying to do good that carries with it a jail sentence. Our disease is what you in the pokey now. But that's getting better and better. I think they're doing something about that. Because AA and alcoholics are becoming the thing in the country. <laughs> that Supreme Court had a meeting and they decided in their wisdom something should be done about drinking in the United States. Court adjourned. <laughs> and you know they went in the back room in the chambers, took off their monkey suits and got drunk. That's what they, they had done a mighty fine job. I know where the hell the money's coming from, but there's a lot of money floating around and uh, it's for 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 alcoholism. <laughs> yeah. Well that's good. If there's enough of it, maybe they'll put us all on their pension. <laughs> And I'm ready. If I can get it, I'm going to. You bet. But it, it's a, I think that alcoholism has almost replaced cholesterol. We're the, we're the real big things now. The reason you can't get kicked out is that this is the only organization that any of us know of. Where when they say they love you, they mean it. You can't imagine somebody calling the sponsor at three in the morning. Always at three in the morning. <laughs> Nobody has to slip in the afternoon. <laughs> Always. But they call the sponsor and say, ah, hello. This is Claude. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but I got drunk and I wet my pants. <laughs> Well, the sponsor isn't going to say, what? You broke one of our rules, you rotten guy. You, don't you call me ever again. No. Bye. No. You can get the old lady up and say, would you heat up the coffee? And uh, where's my book? <laughs> Never find your book. When you want it. And then he gets the coffee and the book and the butterfly net and goes back after Claude once more time. <laughs> One more time for Claude. Nobody at the door of meeting sniffing your breath and said, Oh, hmm, you've been drinking. Huh? <laughs> None of us ever were born, and our big ambition was to become an alcoholic. It just happened. I don't know if we were born with it. Some were, some weren't. Who the hell cares? I know a guy whose wife jerked him out of a sanitarium, took him to the hospital, or psychiatrist to find out why he drank. And on the way, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. Hmm. I told her not to. And on the way to the psychiatrist, he died. She never found out why he drank. <laughs> well, he did, didn't you, Lou? Yeah. Old Whirling Lou. You can't get kicked out, and in my opinion, People that go on the program and then have a little trouble, a lot of trouble, go out on slips and come back. That takes a lot of doing. And I think that they deserve and will get a second and sometimes a third chance. Because it's tough. Christ, it's hard enough the first time, man. I'm not going to do it. But it's just, it's just marvelous. But you cannot get kicked out. Pretty soon they'll get tired. They may throw you out the window, but they'll try <laughs> until you're on the way out. And if you're fairly new on the program, yeah, I've got a big mouth in 30 years. Don't let that worry you. I've only been sober today. It's only the one day. And don't worry, for God's sake, how far you have to go. Be thankful for how far you've come. Even if it's a day. Even if it's a half a day. Just be thankful. Now, the fact that you and I are sober today is not going to straighten out our life, and there will be no bumps through the hills and dales. There will be plenty of those. There is still reality. I must tell you a story that happened to me, and it has a happy ending. Uh, I've been sober 22 years, and my wife of 30 years died of cancer. Now that, 
kicked me off. A very, we were loved. She was a lovely lady. Now, I figured, like every other jerk, why me? That's not fair. What the hell have I been praying for? All this junk thinking. One thing stands out in my mind. Thank God I never thought once of taking a drink. Because I'd heard many times, and hopefully you have, nothing in the world is bad enough that a drink will make it better. We know that. We must live that. So, I had AA. And that's all. I decided to be a hermit. I figured, well, it's, I'm over the hill, Charlie. I lived a long and lusty life. <laughs> and hell with everything. And I'll just sit here and so That's what I'll do. I'll fix everybody. But I did go to meetings. And one night I went to a meeting. Now, this is the glorious part of alcoholic side benefits. I went to this meeting... And I saw a young lady leaning over against the post. And I said to myself, there is a lonesome girl. And I, as an old timer, <laughs> must go and help her. It's what it says in the book. You know. Well, I went over and I mustered up my nerve and I said, hi. <laughs> and she said, hi back. And I was through. I, I don't know what the hell to say. <laughs> See, I was out of practice. <laughs> Well, I got to going, and I said, uh, what are you doing? And she said, I'm going home. My daughter's there. And I said, oh, good. Mm, yes, thank you, and goodbye. Well, I called her again, and then her sponsor got on. I knew her sponsor. Her sponsor said, Jack, why don't you lay off? She got six months on the program. Now, you're not supposed to get, what the hell is that term? I tell a foolish joke. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Emotionally involved. So I talked to this lady, and she had been, had one year birthday cake in Honolulu, right? And she'd been in and out like a yo yo for five months, six months at a time, and she did, she'd mounted up quite a little sobriety there. So I put that all together, and I talked to her sponsor, my AA mother in law, and said, You mind your own business, and uh, I'm going to have a date with this girl. To make a long story short, I'm very happy. We have been married six years. Yeah, six years. Yeah, thank you. And um, her name is Jean, and she had been on the program seven years. And um, she delightful and sends her apologies because her the same daughter uh, decided to make a hasty visit uh, to our home in uh, Palisades, and she had a right because her daughter's going to New York, right? You understand that, please? And she sends her love, and she also is a phone friend of Lou and Rita, and I have had about enough of their damn phone calls. <laughs> Rita? So you're going to put a stop to some of this. Still got the money, Dick? Anyway. <laughs> got to get home yet. I like it. I got I think I'll go on for another hour. This is Mark. You, you both. Listen. <laughs> well, I tell you what I like, especially about these kind of affairs. It is it, more like a party, right? You, you, you're here for some fun, and uh, tell I'm no philosopher. I'm a meat and potato drunk. So are you. We don't need that philosophy. That philosophy and all those big words, what got us here, a lot of us, <laughs> trying to figure out life. Hell, that philosopher like Joe Leith, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I never did. <laughs> and Mary said, don't worry, he doesn't either. So... Uh, <laughs> It's fun. You get the line. But I would be remiss on today's sermon, and what would it be? Uh, uh, son, is it still Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> I've been waiting since February to do this. <laughs> I had to get up at 7 o'clock. I didn't, oh, my God. Anyway, have I fallen down yet? Okay. I think that I'll tell you now uh, I, that I'm an authority... You're laughing here, brother. <laughs> Real 
turkey down there. I'm an authority on religion. What? I really am. I, I'm an authority on religion. And that hasn't got a damn thing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous. Right? I was awful glad to find out it wasn't religion because I had had quite a little of that. Now that's going to shake up the priest. <laughs> And, but the clan members will love it. Anyway. <laughs> huh? I was born. <laughs> Glad to know that. I was, I was born in the Middle West in a little town in Iowa called Hampton, Iowa. Hampton, Iowa, when I was born and grew up to the ripe old age of a sophomore, was 3,900 people, all Methodists but two, <laughs> one Catholic and one Baptist. Anyway, to this day, that little town of Hampton, Iowa, is 3,900, because the minute those cats get their diploma from the high school, <laughs> out of town. Everybody leaves town when they get out of high school and hardly ever come back. But in that little town of Hampton, my mother was a devout Methodist, and I'm no way making fun of her religion. It meant a great deal to her. It meant everything to her. I will tell you this, that my maiden name is John Wesley. <laughs> I'd like to have that kept anonymous. You can't. Uh, Jim Bartell is better than that. But you can't get any Methodist -er than that. And at my mother's knee in those days, I learned the fear of God. Everything was thou shalt not. Do not do this. Do not do that. Thou shalt not do this. God is watching you. God knows what you're doing behind the barn. <laughs> Maybe I cut that out for a couple of days. <laughs> but I was brought up with the fear of God. Everything was spook. And when I got in Alcoholics Anonymous, thank to the magnificence of Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob, and the founders that worked on the book and said, God, as you understand it, keep it simple. Get the hell out of your own. I don't think they said that. Keep out of your own way. <laughs> they meant it. The simplicity and the beauty and in my opinion, the friendship of God. Now, I, I know, I know God has an enormous sense of humor. If God didn't have a sense of humor, he'd have killed us years ago. <laughs> Imagine our God, the AA God, he's looking down there and says, oh, there goes Roy. <laughs> give him about a week, get him to a meeting. I heard a man say a thing which was beautiful in my opinion. He said, don't you worry about God. The minute you walked in that door, God quit worrying about you. That's kind of nice. And don't let it spook you. If you're an atheist, I'm for it. But be a sober atheist. You keep coming back to meetings and we'll get you. <laughs> The beautiful part, the beautiful part is we won't get you till you're ready. And that's fine. You just ease in being a drunk. You can ease in being an alcoholic. And all of us remember believing in God. Get on your knees and pray and then let him alone. Because if you don't, he's going to screw it up anyway. <laughs> don't have to tell drunks about praying. Hmm? Ooh, we prayed all our lives, haven't we? Oh, God, will you just ever sleep this one night? <laughs> God, I hate my boss. I hope he gets a fungus. That's <laughs> oh, God, 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 God. Always the gimme prayer. Gimme, gimme, gimme. That's all it was, wasn't it? Now you see we got something to thank him for. That's great. And if you don't want to pray, if you don't know how to pray, don't help, don't worry about learning. I told Lou the other night I was trying to say the surrender prayer, and I forgot it. Yeah. I got copied now. I won't do that again. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I beg of you, if you're fairly new on the program or fairly old, uh, the least used word in the English language is the word thanks. Yeah. Now, 
if you can't think of a prayer, and if you don't want to pray, and you're spooked or something, when the lights are out, you're all alone, you got through another day, just say thanks. You don't have to thank anybody. You don't have to thank anything. Because God, as I understand, will hear that. And if you're on the Alcoholics Program, and you're doing the best you can, that's all you have to do, the best you can one day at a time, you got an awful lot to say thanks for. Now, I know a couple of prayers. <laughs> Mercifully, they're short. Mercifully, a touch of humor. But that's the way I feel about God. I got, I took over, I forget what business it was lately. And I, oh God, I was going, and all that, you know how we do. And that night when I was talking to God and telling him good night and everything, I got to laughing. And I said, I want to thank you for all the serenity that you gave me today. I huh? do better tomorrow than I do and sneak in bed. And I know God laughed. So, uh, jackass sober, jackass drunk. <laughs> yeah. These two prayers, I love them. And they're very short, and I, I, I just, they mean a lot. This one prayer is, I heard it from a guy who got up every morning of his life since he got on the, and he said this prayer, God, don't you and I get into any trouble today that you can't get me out of. <laughs> Saying, turn your life and your will over. That's a way to turn it over. God, you take it. I'm going to blow it. That's fun. And then there's the one about two little kids. They stand there visiting, and the little kid says one to the other, uh, pray at your house. He says, we pray at our house. We pray. Oh, God, pray before breakfast, during breakfast, after breakfast, on the school. Pray in school. Pray at the playground. Play on the way home. Play after that. Pray, pray before we go to bed. Pray all the time. You don't you pray at your house? He says, yeah. He said, well, when do you pray? And he said, just at night. He said, you want to pray at night? He said, yeah, hell, we ain't scared of the dark. <laughs> yeah. But you and I have gotten over those scare prayers, haven't we? And what a release and what a wonderful gift we've all been given. And the only requisite is that we try and we keep it up and do everything we can that we can't get out of. I didn't get out of this breakfast. <laughs> and I am delighted Lou is such a son of a... that wouldn't let me up. <laughs> and now for the Catholics and then adios. <laughs> the... Um, priest had the um, rabbi over at his house in Paris. <laughs> I know that much. His parish for dinner. And the housekeeper, oh Jesus, rosary, brought out uh, <laughs> never get over that. Eh? <laughs> brought out this huge plate, took the cover off, there was a big ham. And the rabbi said, well, Father, I guess you've forgotten. I don't want to embarrass you, but... Uh, we don't, Orthodox people, <laughs> we don't need a hand. He said, oh, that's too bad. Father said, never mind. Rosary, based a couple of eggs. Brought the eggs in. They had a nice dinner and a nice visit. And the rabbi spent, spent the night and enjoyed it. And he said, now, Father, I enjoyed this evening very much. And I want you to come down to my house some night. And bring your wife. <laughs> and the priest sort of hung his head and scratched his head. And he said, well, I guess that's one apiece. I forgot about ham. And as you know, the priest don't marry. The rabbi said, you don't. Well, you better try it. It's better than ham. <laughs> so no matter what we've been, where we were, or where going now, this way of life is better than any way that there is. And you and I laugh. Thank God for the laughter, which in my opinion is the best way to explain humility. If we can laugh at ourselves, we've got a little bit of humility. And I can use a little more. Anyway, 
We laughed about the fact we're almost dead, putting your nuts in no damn good, which is true, right? All right. Now, to what little we have done with ourselves and what progress we've made, think of this. We have the privilege of becoming an apostle. An apostle is a man who carries the message, a woman that carries the message. And with what we have done with our lives in AA, we can put our hand up to God as we understand him and extend it out to a suffering alcoholic and through us passes the spirit of God. As we can say, come on, if I can help you, I will. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.